The year was 280 BC. Macedon, having just recovered from the final conflicts of the wars of the Diadochoi, was now once again in flames. Earlier that year, a vast horde of barbarian peoples, monstrous as they were skilled at warfare, they broke into Macedon and Greece. Attempts to halt their progress by the new Macedonian king, Ptolemy Caranus, ended in disaster, with his head placed upon a pike and paraded around for all to see. Nothing stood between these new invaders and the Hellenistic kingdoms. But who were these foreigners, who suddenly descended upon the civilized world like a vast tsunami, swallowing everything in their path? Though they themselves went by many names, we know them as the Celts. Join us for a two-part series taking a look at the Celtic peoples and their conflicts with the Hellenistic kingdoms. This is the Celtic Invasion of Greece. Hi there. You're listening to the Hellenistic Age Podcast, Episode 19, The Celtic Invasion of Greece, Celtic Civilization and History, 1300 to 300 BC. Gods, I hate Gauls. Whenever a person hears the word Celt or Gaul, I imagine a few stock images come to mind. Bushy mustaches, painted in woad, riding around on war chariots, druids, wickermen, etc., etc. Readers of Asterix, the Gaul, probably understand this idea completely. It's hard to blame people for having such preconceived notions. I myself am admittedly prone to a bias towards Greco-Roman history and culture. And for a long time, I did not do too much research on the Celtic peoples. I've certainly been exposed to the mythology, tales of heroes like Hugh Hulane, but mostly through the periphery. I also did not grow up among the nations and peoples who consider themselves to be the cultural inheritors of the Celts, such as Wales, Brittany, Ireland, and the like. My own exposure came largely through the works of Julius Caesar and Livy, Roman outsiders who paint a picture of war-loving, wine-drinking, and head-hunting barbarians. Rome, in particular, had a cultural axe to grind, so much of our understanding of the Celts has been colored by these very authors. The Enlightenment era of the 17th, 18th, and 19th century had begun to change the image of the Celt, ranging from the noble savage to reinterpreting Celtic historical figures like Boudicca and Vercingetorix for nationalistic purposes. At the same time, though, Advances in archaeology have uncovered a vast collection of artifacts that are gradually piecing together the long and often misty civilization that dominated much of Central Europe for hundreds of years. But we must begin with a question. What exactly do we mean when we say Celt? The word Celt is derived from the Greek Keltoi and the Latin Celtai, and this is applied to a collection of peoples spread across Central Europe ranging from the eastern portion of the Balkans through modern Germany and France, and eventually making their way to the Iberian Peninsula and the coast of Britain. From this description alone, you probably have made the conclusion that the Romans and Greeks are generalizing a bit, and you're absolutely right. This was not a unified culture, but instead a vast intermixing of tribes, confederations, and kingdoms, which are generally thought to belong to the same civilization. We mostly have to rely on the word of the ancient historians, Greeks and Romans who wrote about their interactions with the Celts, mostly when it came to warfare. Julius Caesar claims in his commentaries on the Gallic War, a series of dispatches detailing his conquest of the Celtic-dominated province of Gaul, the term Celt was the word the Celts used to describe themselves, which is probably not. Though their ancestors had lived in Europe since at least the second millennium, we will assume that what we know as the Celtic language groups generally originated around the Late Bronze Age, roughly 1300 to 1100 BC, when the civilizations of the Aegean and Near East were experiencing a new height of economic complexity and cultural efflorescence. We at this time can generally accept that the origination of a Celtic lingua franca took place here. But it wasn't until the 8th century that we can immediately identify it, thanks to the surviving artifacts showing the language in various scripts, such as Phoenician and Greek. 
Scholars believe that there was a collection of languages present across the Celtic world, grouped largely into insular and continental divisions. Insular was centered in the regions of Britain and the northwestern coast of Europe, while the continental branch was spread across central and southern Europe. It is classified as an Indo-European language, sharing the same roots as Latin, Greek, and even Sanskrit. Words such as the Latin rex, the Sanskrit raj, and the Celtic rix all mean king, and the Celtic language is thought to have an extremely close relationship with the Italic languages, sharing an immediate common ancestor. Linguistic and material similarities allow us to artificially group these diverse peoples together. So, for the purposes of making this episode manageable, I'm going to be making broad assumptions about the collective Celtic peoples, but understand that the Celts would view themselves by their tribal affiliations at most, whereas the Greeks would view themselves as being Greek and the Romans would view themselves as being Roman. The Late Bronze Age shows the general outline of Celtic cultures that can be classified as the Atlantic Zone, roughly the Iberian Peninsula and the coast of Britain, a Rhine-Danube Zone, approximately the areas equating to Germany and much of France and Switzerland, and the Western Mediterranean, which includes parts of Spain, France, and the northernmost part of Italy. We're focusing on the Rhine-Danube and the Western Mediterranean areas. But if you're interested in the Celt-Iberian peoples of the Atlantic Zone, check out the History of Spain podcast, which has recently done a number of episodes on them. In the 8th and 7th centuries, you have two major developments in the history of the Celts. The first is the increased interaction with Mediterranean-based powers, Greeks, Etruscans, and Phoenicians, who all began to colonize the southern Mediterranean and establish trading outposts. This increased interaction and access to commercial goods began to foster increased economic complexity among the Celtic peoples of Central Europe, giving rise to what archaeologists call the Hallstatt period, named after a rich artifact deposit near the small village of Hallstatt in Austria. The Hallstatt period lasted a long time, dating roughly from the 10th to the 5th century BC, and thus is broken down into roughly four parts, A, B, C, and D. I won't bother you with the nitty-gritty of each period, but Hallstatt period was defined by the material culture of the regions. Material culture refers to the physical remains that help us identify the way societies functioned and their beliefs in their personal spaces. The Hallstatt was a time that saw the rise of what can be called a prestige goods economy, where the elites were able to maintain their power by the possession of numerous rare objects from the larger Mediterranean world. We have been able to determine this based upon a surplus of large grave sites, which often contain goods that are either of distinct Greco-Etruscan origin, such as wine, pottery, and jewelry, or local goods that were at the very least influenced by these imports. These grave sites also show an increasingly talented community of metalworkers and builders, with large grave goods like carts, adorned weapons, and armor, primarily made of iron, a unique feature for the Celts. Ironworking was mastered by the Celts of Central Europe approximately around the turn of the millennium, whereas the larger Mediterranean and Near Eastern worlds still relied heavily on bronze, a less durable material but easier to work with. The Celts could offer to the people of the Mediterranean a large amount of natural resources, timber, furs, amber, iron, and most of all, tin, which was in short supply and essential in the production of bronze. The Hallstatt period ended with a rather dramatic and sudden collapse of many of these prestige economy societies. Archaeologists are unsure of why many of these settlements dating from the period were abandoned, but hypotheses suggest that the increasing ties to the Etruscan traders of northern Italy and the Greek colonists of southern Gaul forced a displacement of populations closer towards these areas, resulting in the complex trading system to fall apart akin to the economic collapse of Near Eastern and Mycenaean powers of the Late Bronze Age. But rather than falling into a dark age, the focus of Celtic life moved away from Central Europe towards Southern Gaul, and the flowering, or some would say the swan song, of Celtic life and culture would arise in the so-called Latin period, dating approximately from the late 5th to the late 1st century BC, Latin being the name of an archaeological site in modern Switzerland. From the material goods that survived, it is clear that society had rapidly advanced during this time, with the centralization of political life away from the prestige economy to something more stable, yet more complex. 
This collapse of the Hallstatt and the reorientation of the Celtic world led to increased contact with the Mediterranean, as we get our first appearances of the Celts in the sources of the Greco-Roman world at this time. Herodotus, writing in the 5th century, briefly speaks of the Celts of Western Europe, but knows very little about them. The Romans encountered the Gauls in the early 4th century, leading to the sack of Rome. Virtually all of the written material of what we know of the Celtic peoples comes from this period, probably due to the increasing populations of the Celtic communities, leading to migrations and deep raiding events that forced contact, for good and for bad. By the late Latin period in the 2nd and 1st centuries BC, Celtic civilization was centered around what the Romans termed opida. Opida refers to large elevated hill forts, but fort is a bit of a misnomer. They were indeed heavily defended, surrounded by large palisades and wooden fortifications to deter any potential attackers. But they were also rather sophisticated and more urbanized than most people would expect given the amount of labor and materials it would take to construct the earthenworks alone. Inside would be a thriving commercial and social life, where the people went about their business, dealing with traders, selling in the market, and honing their personal crafts. The local economy was often secured by the minting of coined money, which further indicates that stabilized political centers were now present. This political centralization was probably a result of their increased contract with the more urbanized Greek and Romans, and while it is a bit later than the period we'll be focusing on in the next episode, I wanted to bring it up now to dispel some of the myths and preconceptions of the Celts. In terms of technology, we can positively identify some unique inventions and developments. The use of the four-wheeled wagon, for instance, which quickly spread across the Mediterranean for its practical benefits in terms of trading and warfare. The development of complex woodworking was an essential trade, especially since much of Central Europe pre-Roman invasion was absolutely covered in forest, and thus lumber was easily accessible for use in house building, ramparts, and other structures. But above all the other Celtic talents was their skill at metalworking. As I've already mentioned, ironworking was a technique discovered in the early Hallstatt period, but over the centuries the craft was being honed and mastered with a remarkable result. Iron itself is much harder to work with than bronze, yet the Celts managed to turn it into an art form. This talent was not just restricted to iron, and we have a large amount of burial goods that have survived, showing beautifully ornate gold and silver jewelry like torques, belt buckles, armor, and engravings. Typical of the Latin culture is the so-called swirly artwork, with almost abstract designs with animal and human faces emerging from the patterns, and the triskelion. I've included a number of examples of Celtic handiwork for this episode's show notes on my website. Check it out, there's some pretty incredible stuff in there. When one thinks of a Celtic governing body, some immediately think of a king, like the first century leader of the Averni versus King Gedorix, who was declared king in response to the conquest of Gaul by Julius Caesar. In fact, kings were an uncommon sight in the continental Celtic world. We instead attribute the ruling class of Celts as a warrior aristocracy, belonging to tuta, or tribes. Caesar himself claims in the Gallic commentaries that the only two important classes to the Celts were the Equites, or the Knights, and the Druids. These Knights are roughly equated to a mounted upper class, since it was very expensive in the ancient world to be able to own one horse, let alone several. These warrior elites would attract a band of followers, or clients. The clients would provide a food payment, military service, and political support. But in return, they would receive legal representation, gifts, and protection. The number of supporters can range in the hundreds to an extreme like of Orgetorix, a wealthy nobleman of the Helvetii, who was able to summon 10,000 clients to help him acquit him from a trial. This system of clients is similar in function to the patrones clientes system of ancient Rome, and the number of supporters one had was a big part of displaying one's self-importance and status. Connected to this would be the use of court rituals and behaviors to bolster one's prestige. 
being a largely oral culture, an immense value was placed on the role of a bard, who would sing the praises of the Lord, their deeds in battle, and provide entertainment in the reciting of mythology stories and song. These bards would be present at the feast, which was a very hierarchical and important event in Celtic society. The bravest of warriors, or the chieftains, would receive specialized cuts of meat. The seating arrangement was based upon your status, etc. But the true purpose of these feasts was to allow for the movement up and down the social hierarchy. This organizational ladder isn't like petty office politics with passive-aggressive favor trading. This involved killing one another. Duels and fights to the deaths were part and parcel of a feast. People died over a particular cut of meat. People died over simple ambition. The gathering of the political elite of the region allowed a young man to demonstrate his own worth and self-image, and trial by combat in front of the feast was an important way to show one's worth. Warfare is something unmistakably important to the Celts, as it was to every ancient society. But the Celtic notion of warfare differs in the sense of its cultural role, how it defines how it's waged and sustained. Authors like Caesar, Livy, and Polybius paint a remarkable image of what Celtic warfare was like. Instead of an organized formation akin to the Macedonian phalanx or the Roman manipular legion, the initial attack was more like a tidal wave, crashing upon the enemy troops in a mad dash. It was also loud, with war cries and beating shields of the young warriors eager to display their martial prowess along with the trumpeting of a horn-like instrument known as the carnix, which is often shaped like a dragon or a boar, and was used to communicate signals on the battlefield. John Kenny, an Edinburgh-based composer, trombonist, and musical archaeologist professor at the Guildhall School of Music and Drama in London, who works with Carnix and company to recreate the sounds of Iron Age music and instruments, has kindly provided an example of the sounds of a recreated Carnix. So take a listen to what was likely heard across the battlefields. I'll provide a link in the show notes and in the podcast description to Mr. Kenny's website, www.carnix.org.uk, where you can find more about his work. Check it out. He's produced some hauntingly beautiful music, which shows the artistic and soulful side of an instrument that people have normally only associated with ancient warfare. The image of the naked Celtic warrior running onto the battlefield was a powerful one to the Greeks and Romans and it was probably used as a way to terrify their enemies, especially since your average Greek or Roman stood about roughly 5 foot 4 to 5 foot 6, and the Celts themselves were between 5 foot 8 to 6 feet tall. It also managed to further add to your own sense of martial prowess and bravery. But contrary to this, the Celtic warrior could be remarkably armed and equipped. Their talent for metalwork would develop chainmail, which would be adopted by the armies of the Mediterranean world as being superior to your standard bronze cuirass or your lino thorax. Describing the armor as ornate is a good way to put it, with bronze and iron helmets crafted with perched metal birds that would flap while you ran, or large horns that jutted from the skull piece. In addition, the warrior would use large oblong shields, often with a metal emboss in the middle, and pair it with a short spear or a long slashing sword. Everything about what we know screams ornate displays, because the warrior wanted to be seen on the battlefield. It was part of a successful warband leader's initiative to display his personal wealth and bravery in the form of beautiful arms, armor, and jewelry like the famed Torque, a metal band that wrapped around your neck, which was an unmistakably Celtic feature. The Greek writer Diodorus Siculus speaks of this need for personal display and bravery. Quote, when the armies are drawn up in battle array, they, meaning the chiefs, are wont to advance before the battle line, and to challenge the bravest of their opponents to single combat. 
at the same time brandishing before them their arms so as to terrify their foe. They loudly recite the deeds of valor of their ancestors, and proclaim their own valorous quality, at the same time abusing and making little of their opponent, and generally attempting to rob him beforehand of his fighting spirit. End quote. Chariots were also an effective way to make sure your presence was known on the battlefield, but their use was probably more archaic, given the development of the saddle leading to horseback riding becoming more popular, and we only tend to see it in Britain and Ireland, which seems to have not developed as rapidly as their continental cousins. In any respects, warfare was how a Celtic chieftain established their worthiness to follow, how they provided the goods to host feasts and drinking parties, to give gifts to their followers and retainers. What we are often told by the ancient authors of great Celtic invasions were probably just raiding parties that got way out of hand, rather than a conscious notion of conquest and settlement. And now, a word from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by Audible. I've always been an avid reader, but as anyone knows, real life tends to get in the way, and sometimes it's hard to find time to sit down and dedicate yourself to just read a book. This is why I use Audible, since it provides an unparalleled library of audiobooks, original shows, and more, making sure I get to listen to some of my favorite books on the go. As a special treat for listeners of the show, Audible is offering a 30-day free trial and an audiobook for you to keep for free. This week, I'm going to recommend Xenophon's March of the Ten Thousand, narrated by Charlton Griffin. One of the first great adventure stories, the 4th century Greek author Xenophon tells of a Persian civil war gone wrong, resulting in him being given command of 10,000 Greek mercenaries while trapped behind enemy lines, deep in the heart of Persia, and must flee back to Greece before the army falls apart. To get this book for free and to support the show, click on the link below or type up audibletrial.com forward slash Hellenistic Age Podcast. That's audibletrial.com forward slash Hellenistic Age Podcast, and get started today. While the upper levels of politics and warfare were largely dominated by the Celtic male elite, the Celtic female shows a higher level of autonomy and independence in the personal household and internal politics. Women in Celtic societies in general had a more prominent role than their contemporaries in the Greco-Roman world, a very curious and sometimes scandalous thing to outside observers. Rumors abounded of sexual promiscuity, and the image of a warlike Celtic woman like Boudicca has remained a strong image in our subconscious. We have to be careful when reading these interpretations by the Greek and Roman authors. Who could have possibly stressed these ideas to emphasize the barbarian-like qualities of the Celts? At the same time, many legends and myths list these autonomous and more aggressive queens like Medip, and we have a number of instances of women joining along with the men to the battlefield to cheer them on, or emasculate them if they were being cowardly. Though this latter practice would lead to disaster in the Roman conquest of Gaul, when Roman cavalry ran down the women of the Helvetii, who were among the baggage train which was being plundered by Roman troops. Women were often engaged in political marriages and alliances, as was commonly done in much of the ancient world. They held legal rights that gave them the right to choose who their husbands were to be, at least on paper. This doesn't mean that families didn't pressure their daughters and sisters to marry certain people for political reasons, but the option was apparently present. They were also given the right to divorce and retain their property, and their economic and social status before marriage would grant them various levels of power in the relationship. For instance, if the bride was wealthier than the husband, then she was given a high degree of independence. If the bride was poor, she could be considered little more than a concubine, and Caesar even comments that some Celtic husbands could hold the power of life and death over their wives. Some scholars of the past have attempted to view Celtic societies as matriarchal, but this view has been mostly discredited. The equality between Celtic men and women isn't as great as it once was purported to be, but at the same time, we must note the level of peculiarity of Celtic women and their role in society when viewed in the eyes of Greeks and Romans. Clearly, they must have been more autonomous than if they were to be in a Greco-Roman one. One of the most intriguing and complicated aspects of the Celtic society was its religious notions. 
We have a rich tradition of mythology that managed to survive, thanks largely to the Irish, who were able to transcribe their oral tradition into writing in late antiquity. Though it may not completely piece together the belief system of the continental Celts, they are useful when we want to work backwards and aid with whatever existing evidence we currently have. From a basic viewpoint, the Celtic religion was polytheistic, and we have well over 200 different deities named. But it is very likely that the gods were not limited to one particular form or name. And while saying it was a form of henotheism, the idea that one singular god appears in many different fashions is probably incorrect, the Celts were a bit more fluid in terms of how they interpreted their gods. The Greeks and Romans commonly attempted to reconciliate their gods with the Celts, attempting to identify common motifs in imagery. Caesar simply referred to the Celtic gods as the Roman equivalent, referring to Lugus as Hermes, Taranis as Jupiter, etc., etc., while the first century Roman poet Lucan identified a triad of gods that were dominant, and the Celts seemed to have a proclivity towards threes, with various other triads being identified over these centuries. Nothing is ever simple, and it is very likely that each tribe had different flavors of religious belief, and to ascribe a singular pantheon is a foolish attempt at best. We can understand that the Celts believed in the coexistence of the divine with the mortal world, the land itself and various parts of it, the stones, the rivers, the groves, and springs, all could be imbued with individual spirits and deities, and these would command a level of dedications and offerings. But the most controversial aspects that have come down to us about Celtic religion include druids and human sacrifice. The druids had a remarkable number of privileges, including the right of sacrifices, exemption from military service, the ability to act as judge and arbitrator between various disputing parties, and could effectively designate people as pariahs, and thus their potential for enormous political influence can be seen. Evidence suggests that the druids were more of an archaic throwback, given that their center of power was located among the more quote-unquote backward Celts of Britain. These druids would meet once a year to settle affairs across the land and elect one person to be the supreme leader of the druids. It apparently took a long time to train oneself in druidism, approximately 20 years or so, and they thus were considered extremely suspicious by the Romans, who believed them to be the masterminds of many Celtic uprisings and would actively persecute them for their religious beliefs, unusual given their flexibility with other polytheistic religions. Human sacrifice is always a touchy subject, and is often heavily scrutinized by historians and archaeologists. The Roman tradition maintained that human sacrifices were common aspects of Celtic religion. The poet Lucan claims that the gods each preferred a method of sacrifice. Teutates demanded victims to be drowned, Esus required hangings, and Tutaranis burning men alive. We have discovered bodies in bogs which have been well preserved in such oxygen-free environments that we have quite a bit of organic material that on them that survives. Needless to say, they show clear signs of ritualistic killing. Lucan also gives a rather disturbing passage about the imagery of a sacred grove, covered in human gore and surrounded by carved wooden figures in the image of their gods. Sacrifice was always something that the Celtic gods demanded and the Celts often decided to deposit their sacrifices in particular locations, in lakes, bogs, in the soil. All are where vast hordes of treasure, weapons, and armor have all been recovered over the decades. These apparently were held to be sacred, and disturbing them would invoke a horrible punishment of ritual torture and execution. Headhunting was also a popular sport, attested to in the primary literature and by archaeological records, which has turned up monuments that specifically allowed a skull to be placed inside of them for display in the home, much like a trophy hunter would. It was also a way to capture the power of the enemy, since the Celts believed that the soul of the victim was housed in their head. This discussion on human sacrifice fits into my last topic of discussion, the image of the Celts in Greek and Roman eyes. Wait, some of you may say, but didn't we just repeatedly go over Greek and Roman observations of Celtic life and you've talked about how they could color? You're right, but I wanted to address more about the way the Greco-Roman authors saw them, rather than what we can interpret about the Celts from them. The Celtoi, Celtai, or Gaul, whatever terminology you may want to use, was a number of things to the Greeks and Romans. The most obvious is that the Celt represented a monstrous force, barbarism incarnate, who brought ruin upon a civilized peoples. The sack of Rome in 390 BC by the Celtic warlord Brennus 
which is just probably a title for king rather than an actual name, it forever scarred Roman psyche. It's often paraphrased as a form of collective PTSD, but the ferocity and the mercilessness the Romans had for the Celts is indicative to just how much fear they engendered into them. It should be noted that both the so-called second and third founders of Rome, Marcus Furius Camillus and Gaius Marus respectively, earned their titles for defeating Celtic invaders. The defeat of the Celts in battle was a high honor, as can be seen in the famous David and Goliath-esque duel between an enormous Gallic warrior and the Roman Titus Manlius Imperiosus Torquatus. The cognomen Torquatus is in reference to the famous Torque jewelry worn around the neck of the Celts, which Torquatus claimed after killing the Gaul. The Celts appeared to be the antithesis of everything that would make a civilized Greek or Roman. Their women were warlike, they drank an ungodly amount of unmixed wine, practiced human sacrifice, and they even wore trousers, Jupiter help us. This wasn't limited to the Romans as well, because in the late 3rd and 2nd centuries, Hellenistic kings would later use their defeats over the Galatians, the Celts who would settle in Asia Minor, as propaganda pieces to show civilization's triumph over the barbarian hordes. Don't worry, we'll talk about the Galatians in their own episode. At the same time, the ancients had a begrudging respect for the Celts. Celtic mercenaries would be sought throughout the ancient world, famed for their bravery and their skill as cavalrymen, famously serving along Hannibal during the Second Punic War and employed in many of the Hellenistic kingdoms. The Romans based some of their military equipment on Celtic arms and armor, attesting to their great skill and value in metalworking. Many authors of the period would also paint the Celtic peoples as sort of a noble savage. For those unfamiliar with this term, this is the belief that man, untouched by the vices and corrupting natures of civilization, is at his most pure and moral self. Similar to the actions of the romantic authors of the 18th and 19th centuries depicting Native Americans. One of the most famous pieces of Hellenistic art is a sculpture known as the Dying Gaul, which depicts a grievously wounded Galatian, bravely and serenely awaiting his death. It was originally commissioned by Attalus I of Pergamon, and was probably a companion piece to the other famous work, the so-called Luluvisi Gaul, who has just killed his wife and attempts to commit suicide, rather than letting them be taken captive. It's a rather moving image, especially considering that this was a monument to celebrate the victory over these very same people. The fear of the Celts and their status as chaotic and destructive interlopers would lead to tragedy, where massacres, mass enslavement, and conquest was wrought upon the Celtic peoples. The beginning of the Hellenistic Age marks the high point of Celtic spread and influence throughout Europe, and by the end of Augustus Caesar's conquest of Pannonia in modern Hungary in roughly 15 to 20 AD, Celtic civilization on the continent would be effectively snuffed out, though it would survive in small pockets of provincial life. What I had hoped to accomplish in this episode was to paint the complex picture of the Celtic people and their world, despite the preconceived notions that immediately come to mind. There are two great volumes on the Celts which I highly recommend for you all to check out further if you're interested in the topic. There's the smaller, The Ancient Celts by Barry Cunliffe, and there's the more gargantuan tome-like, The Celtic World, edited by Miranda Green. It must be understood that peace between the Mediterranean peoples and the Celts was never guaranteed. In fact, the wars of the Diadochoi and internal squabbling had left the wealthy lands of Greece and the Near East unstable and weakened. The wealth of the East had flooded the territories of the former Macedonian Empire, and it looked ripe for the picking. The Celts would explode into the Hellenistic world and leave ruin in their wake. Join us in part two, as we will be covering the Celtic invasion of Greece. <laughs>